with anything that, that you'd like to uh, have held in prayer. But uh, we recognize that that's not always the most comfortable or appropriate way to lift your prayer uh, up uh, in the midst of God's uh, body today. So if that's you, you'd like to fill out one of those prayer cards, you can uh, fill that out, drop it in the offering plate later on in the service. You can get that to one of our ushers. You can hand it to me on your way out, and we will funnel those prayer requests to the uh, prayer warrior uh, uh, email chain and make sure that you're kept in prayer throughout this week. So if that's you, take advantage of that. We also want to invite you to join us in the fellowship hall right after the service today for some fellowship time. Uh, lots of great uh, fellowship time to be had here. Uh, grab yourself a cup of coffee, get yourself some goodies, find yourself at a table. Uh, you have opportunities uh, abound back there to uh, engage in all kinds. We also have uh, a couple of opportunities for you to support our uh, youth in their summer trip. You can uh, do the envelope ministry where you just pluck off an envelope with a dollar amount you'd like to contribute, stick it in there, and, and get it into the office. Uh, hand it to Deb, we'll funnel it to the youth. Uh, or if you are, are interested in some, uh, in some fundraiser swag, they have Brighton United Methodist Church t-shirts in a variety of colors, and you can purchase yours. And... Uh, all of the proceeds from that will go to support the youth in their trip this summer. So uh, please help us with that. Uh, we also uh, have um, uh, an announcement to make about some of our staff. We are going to be saying goodbye to uh, uh, our longtime AV tech, Greg Friedholm. Everybody turn around. You, if you haven't seen Greg, he, he lives up in the back. Yep. Uh, Greg does one of those jobs that if you know it's happening, it's probably not good. Uh, so if, you, if you've never seen or uh, known that Greg was up there uh, making all of us sound so beautiful and, and uh, look so great, uh, working the screens and all, if you didn't know that, uh, that's probably a good thing. Uh, but uh, we are certainly grateful for all of his expertise, and he's been with us for a long time. Uh, of course, uh, been a part of the church even longer, but uh, we're grateful for all that he's given to us, and we wish him well as he uh, embarks on some new adventures. Uh, but that also means we have an opening coming up, and that is for anybody who might be interested in learning about our AV uh, tech position and uh, would be interested in helping us out uh, on a weekly basis. We'd love to hear from you. There are ways for you to apply. Uh, if you'd like, you can find uh, Sue uh, Slaughter or Carrie, who's hiding. Carrie is hiding somewhere. I don't know. Uh, uh, Sue and Carrie are our chairs of the Staff Parish Relations Committee. They handle the the, uh, that committee handles the hiring of all of our staff, and so I uh, want to encourage you to seek them out if you'd like to know more about that position uh, and apply. Or if you have somebody that you know in the community or somebody in your life that might be interested, funnel that information to them. We'd love to have them apply as well. Now, uh, next Sunday, we have a real treat coming to town. The Dakota Wesleyan uh, Music Program is going to be uh, descending upon us and blessing us with great music. Uh, and uh, they, we are going to try and bless them with some uh, uh, good old-fashioned Methodist hospitality. Uh, we're going to have a, a meal uh, for them before their concert next Sunday night. And, but we also need places for them to sleep. And uh, the more places we have for them to sleep, the better our hospitality can be for them. If you have a spare bed that you could lend to a couple of college students uh, as they're uh, coming by, you come to the concert, you take a couple of college students home with you, you give them some breakfast, you bring them back the next morning and uh, drop them off. It's kind of like grandparenting, only college style. And uh, a lot of fun. So if you'd like to help us out with that, you want to find uh, Levita in the back. Uh, she's coordinating that with us, uh, for us. So uh, if you could lend a bed to some college students next Sunday evening, uh, we'd love to have you uh, check with Levita about that. Uh, we also, and of course, come to the concert. Uh, there's information in your bulletin about uh, times and when and where and all that. But uh, come and join us for a, a beautiful concert next Sunday evening uh, of music from the Dakota Wesleyan uh, Choirs. Uh, we always want to encourage you to find your way into one of our Bible studies, and, and I would encourage you, if you haven't found your way into one of our small groups, uh, to uh, check the bulletin out. There's lots of opportunities there. If you're still not finding something that uh, fits or you're not sure which of the options would be best for you, um, come and find me after the service. I'd love to talk with you about how you can plug in, but I want to challenge you to do that. And uh, we have a very special challenge going right now. Uh, many of you are uh, up to speed and and keeping up to date on all that's going on in the United Methodist Church. Uh, right now, the special called General Conference is meeting in St. Louis, 
Missouri. They began worship at 6.30 our time this morning, uh, 7.30 their time, and they are, uh, I'm sure, hip deep in the work of the conference right now, making some important decisions for the future of our denomination. And we want to be very intentional as a part of that larger denomination to hold those uh, participating in this important decision-making in, in our prayers. And so uh, we have designed a couple of opportunities for you to do that. Of course, we want to encourage all of, all of you to be praying for the General Conference and all that's going on right now uh, continually, but uh, we don't want to invite you uh, this afternoon. Uh, at 1 o'clock, right here in our sanctuary, we're going to have a prayer meeting. It'll be a time of guided prayer and scripture and grounding ourselves uh, and opening our hearts to God and how we can be keeping uh, the folks uh, in St. Louis in our prayers. And so I want to encourage you to join us for that. Uh, that will also be a template for you if you'd like uh, some guidance on how to pray for General Conference in the coming days. Uh, that would be a, an opportunity for you as well. And then on Tuesday, uh, we're going to have uh, a prayer vigil. It's not going to be as quite as organized as uh, the prayer vigils we've had in the past as far as assigning people different times of the day, but we would just encourage you that from, from morning until evening on Tuesday that you would continually lift up the church in prayer. And if you'd like and, and are able to come down to the church, the sanctuary will be open and available, prepared by our worship committee to, uh, to receive you here and to encourage your, your attitude of prayer as you join uh, the whole denomination across this world praying for uh, decisions being made. So uh, with that, let us greet each other in the peace and love of Christ as we begin our worship service this morning. into the atmosphere of worship this morning through the opening verses of Psalm 67. Psalm 67 begins, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face to shine upon us that Your way may be known upon earth, Your saving power among all nations. Let 
the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. We gather as the body of Christ, people touched by the grace and the blessings of God. We know that no matter what our circumstances are, God's grace stands as our firm foundation. Resting on Him, we come before God in worship. We come that all might know upon the earth the saving power of God. So we, God's people, join with the heavenly host in praising God in grace and thanksgiving. Let us join now in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we come before you as a people who have been redeemed by the loving and gracious power of your Holy Spirit. Come and meet us in this place. Give us a fresh encounter with your Spirit today. May it refresh our lives. May it reboot our week. May it fill us to overflowing with your love. Lord, come into our hearts that they might be strangely warm. Come into our minds that they might be truly inspired. Lord, take hold of our lives and transform us to your glory that we might come before you humbled and transformed, filled with your love, embodying your grace, prepared as your bride. Lord, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. To my God, Lord, I lifted up, Lord, come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it. I want to invite the children down front for just a moment. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Brand new, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How's everybody doing today? So, do we have any guests that's in the box? A toy? Should we open? Should we open it? It's not a toy. It's a, <laughs> it's a dead bug. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Oh, it's even better. It's lint. <laughs> well, that's that's interesting. So. <laughs> This is supposed to be Jenny today, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how can we see God in Lent? <laughs> Any clues at all? <laughs> Do I have it? Jenny? So, do you guys know what the dryer does for us? It dries our clothes, right? And it takes all of our lint off of our clothes. But in order to do that, you need a dryer sheet or some sort of other thing that takes the lint away. And that is just like how God gives us the tools to believe in him. So using the Bible, we can get to know God better. And that's just like using a dryer sheet to take the lint away from our clothes. Pretty good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> She's, we're done. <laughs> she did great. <laughs> she didn't need me up here. <laughs> so um, she kind of stole my thunder because I was thinking the same way that, but I look at Lent as being um, Satan. We look at it as being Satan. And God <laughs> takes that and takes it away from us, the Lent and the dirty stuff away from us. 
if we just do our prayers and we talk to him and stay steadfast with his love. So, and then he'll keep the lint off of us, keep Satan away from us. So whenever you see lint, think of God keeping us clean and pure. Very good. <laughs> Laughing at my saint. <laughs> okay, another thing that we have here is today um, is four Sundays, so of course the congregation helped us pack these totes again for the bags. And for um, some of you that aren't familiar, we are in um, cahoots with the Food Bank of the Rockies, and they supply food to us once a week, and we are actually doing 108 families right now. Um, this food, they give us about six to seven items each week. Um, we pack the bags, and we take them to schools for children that don't have any food for the week, weekend, and so forth. So this helps nourish their, 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 um, the kids so they can come back and be ready to learn at school and so forth. The cost is absolutely nothing to us other than our time and energy to sack the food. Um, the Food Bank of the Rocky, like I says, donates all of this food for this program. And we are currently doing four schools in Brighton and one in Henderson. So um, we do 108 kids each week. It's pretty amazing. So thank you all for helping to tote today. We always pray over them, so that's why the bag's up here today, so that we can, can pray over it. Um, so if you guys want to grab a hand. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time to come together and learn more about you, your love, and just how you protect us from all the evil that's around us. Lord, we ask that you bless this food to the children that are in need of it, that it helps them to nourish their bodies so that they can be alert to see you around them and in their surroundings. We ask this in your son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 children, all the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. It is that time in our sermon to share joys and concerns. Does anyone have any joys to share? I have a joy. This week, uh, Deb and I celebrated our 37th. And I know what you're saying. How can anybody stick with me for 37 years? <laughs> that is quite the, quite the work. So. Any other joys? Good morning. Um, I'm here with Elizabeth this morning and not my wife. And everybody's wondering, where's your wife? Where's your wife? And I'm not sure if they ask about me like that when I'm not here. But anyway, she's out of town for eight days, so I'm home alone for eight days. So uh, just prayers for her safe travels and prayers for me that I managed to find something to eat for eight days. So if I come in next week real skinny, you know what happened to me. But anyway, uh, she was uh, visiting a, a church in Bettendorf, Iowa this morning, and she says it's, it was nice, but it's not home. So she misses everybody. And, just prayers for her. Thank you. Does anyone have any concerns? I would lift up one uh, that I, I heard about uh, as I was beginning service today. Jean Esser is going to have back surgery and is in a great deal of pain. Uh, the surgery is going to be on uh, February 27th, so this coming week. So just be keeping uh, Jean, uh, who's already been through some serious surgery uh, not too long ago, uh, just keep her and, of course, Don in your prayers uh, as she faces another surgery. Yes, my name's Sue Slaughter. I just want to give you an update on Barbara McBride. Um, I think most of you may know that she was in the hospital. She came home basically in hospice services. Um, she wasn't. Now she is, again, getting hospice services. But while she was in the hospital, the pump room next to her apartment started leaking. And a couple of days ago, she found out there was this big puddle of water all over her house. So she is now staying at the Best Western for a week while they repair her apartment. So that's just on top of everything else. We. 
the Best Western provides everything except food. <laughs> and so we are doing a meal train for her this week. Um, and Lisa will send that out tomorrow. But if anyone wants to help to provide a meal for Barbara, she has a refrigerator, a microwave, but can't really do any cooking. So just a small microwave or room temperature serving midday is when she likes to eat. So we would love to help her to the sign. Oh, and my husband said he misses you all. He's got a cold and he didn't come because he doesn't want to give it to you. I'm Levita Lowry. And one issue that we've helped with before in numerous ways has been human trafficking. Avante House here in the Adams County area um, had some funding cut and they are in desperate need of helping the girls that they have. So if there's any way, way that you would be able to help the Avanti House, please contact me. Thank you. One more I forgot to mention. Uh, I lifted up my brother-in-law who uh, deployed <coughs> last Sunday uh, to Syria. He hasn't quite made it there yet, but they're on their way. Uh, but I uh, would lift up my sister-in-law, uh, Veda Skinner, um, a talent now, Veda Talent, who uh, she's dealing with what it means to be the spouse of a deployed service member, and uh, also <clears throat> will be moving back to Florida uh, uh, during his deployment, uh, and she leaves this week. So she's in the midst of trying to move off base and get all that, and then ship to Florida and all the details. So just the stress of doing that by herself. So just lift up her and keep her in your prayers, please. If there are no more things of concern, just go ahead and close out. As we began last week, uh, an intentional time in our worship services, keeping the United Methodist Church in our thoughts and prayers, even as the General Conference gathers in St. Louis, I want to lead us today in a time of prayer uh, for the anxious, uh, the anxiousness that lives in um, not only our congregation, but uh, in our sister congregations, uh, the leaders and uh, the people who are waiting uh, to hear what happens in St. Louis. So I want to just invite us into an intentional time of focusing our prayer on uh, um, uh, our sister churches as we, as we live in this anxious time. Let us pray. creating and sustaining God. We come before you in the powerful and the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Lord, we just acknowledge before you today that we feel the anxiety of our time. We feel the tension of difficult discussions happening on our behalf. We read in the news about the strife in our denomination. We see on social media commentaries that are flying back and forth and here and there. Lord, it can all seem like it's so far away that it's so far beyond what we have the power to affect. But as we gather as a denomination, we're aware that we are gathering as churches across this nation, across this world. Or we just want to lift up we want to lift up all of those congregations that are waiting anxiously for news from the conference. We pray that you would bring peace to those places. That you would bring assurance of 
your sovereignty, conviction of your love and grace, so that your Holy Spirit would rest upon them. Lord, we lift up those leaders who are waiting to see how to lead into whatever happens. Lord, we lift up the thousands of pastors across our world. You seek to lead your churches through these tense times. May you lighten their burden. Fill them with confidence. Bring them peace and faith and hope and love. And equip them with how to lead your people. Lord, in your word we hear, Jesus, teach us not to be anxious about tomorrow. But that is so difficult sometimes. We pray for the strength and the courage to do just that. To live in the now. To share your love and grace with the people on our right and on our left. Lord, above all, we ask that you would use us to build your kingdom. That your Holy Spirit would guide our every thought and word. And that you would bring us to know that peace that passes all understanding in the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we lift our prayers to you in the powerful and that precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The one who taught us how to live. The one who shows us how to love. and The one who brings us together in prayer as we now join in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our responsive hymn is hymn number 2254. It's in the faith we sing. And it's called In Remembrance of Me. Let us join our voices together in song and praise. Yeah. 
by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor, in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place, and then disgraced, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, and then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at that table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you and you will be repaid at the re resurrection of the righteous. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I must go out and see it. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to go try them out. Please accept my regrets. Another said, I have just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to the slave, Go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you've ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and the lanes and compel people to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who are invited will taste my dinner. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ, our Lord. I don't know about any of you, but all that talk of dinner makes me kind of hungry, right? A little bit of that. Thank you, Julie. Great job. Uh, so we wrapped up our series on, on the grace and love of God last week, and uh, we've got a couple of Sundays here between that series and the start of Lent, which comes the first Wednesday in March. And so we had these two weeks on the schedule, looking at what we might talk about, looking at uh, what God might have for us, and it just so happens that these two weeks on the schedule land right over when the General Conference is meeting in St. Louis. They're doing lots of searching about what it means to be the church, what it means for us to be the United Methodist Church what it means for us to be one church. The United Methodist Church grappling with what it means to be church on a global level, but I want to take the next two weeks to really ground us in what it means to be the church right here in Brighton, Colorado. 
What does it mean for us to be the church? You and me, inside and outside these walls here in Brighton. We do not have control over what happens at General Conference. We don't even honestly have a say. But we do have control over how we are church right here, where God has planted us. Uh, I want to begin, and if you happen to have a Bible with you, I would love for you to to turn with me to uh, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. There's a passage I've mentioned in previous messages before, uh, but it's, a, it's kind of a summation of, of the practice of the early church. What did the early followers of Jesus do at the very earliest time we can possibly go back to? And we turn to Luke's account of uh, the book of Acts. Uh, some of you will remember uh, Peter has, has had the Holy Spirit fall on him at Pentecost, right? And he rises up when people around him begin to ponder about whether or not the disciples are drunk. And he, and he gives this first Holy Spirit-inspired sermon. 3,000 people uh, come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and begin to follow uh, the apostles in, um, in what it means to be the earliest form of the church, right? And, and here in verse 46, or 42, I'm sorry, in verse 42 of chapter 2, it, it, it says this. It says, so those who welcomed his message, that's Peter's message, were baptized, and that day... About 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to, check this out, the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Four things that seemed to be central to what made them church. Four things. The apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. Well, first of all, the apostles' teaching is... uh, what Jesus taught, right? They were teaching what Jesus taught, and what Jesus teaches becomes the foundation of what we now refer to as the New Testament. So the apostles' teaching could be likened to the the New Testament, which becomes the fulfillment of the Old Testament, Scripture, right? They're, They're devoted to the Word of God. They're devoted to the Word of God as handed down to them. They're devoted to fellowship. Does that mean they, uh, they had the first ever potluck, perhaps, right? Ancient Galilean potluck, perhaps? Uh, you know, we Methodists have perfected that over the years. But the truth is that fellowship is more than just some donuts and coffee after the church service, right? Fellowship is really that time where I bear my soul to you and you bear it to me. And we live in together. We live in this world together as, as people of God. It's, it's best pictured. I, I, I can't tell you how... Uh, grateful I am for the picture of the, the class meetings and how they have become a picture of what true fellowship in the life of the church can be. That coming together, how is it with your soul? How is your walk with the Lord? Where do you see God at work in this world can be such a powerful fellowship. They've got the scriptures. They've got fellowship. They've got the breaking of bread and the prayers. We're going to deal with the prayers after Sunday school today at 1 o'clock, join us here for the prayer meeting. We're going to be dealing with, with what it means to be the body of Christ in prayer. But the thing I want to highlight now is this, the breaking of the bread. The breaking of bread. This phrase happens a lot in Luke's writing. It happens a lot in the Gospels. And it is one of the four things that the early church is doing when they first become the church, when they first have the Holy Spirit fall upon them, it's one of the four things that they focus on. And then the final thing comes in verse 46. In verse 46, it says, Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread again at home and ate food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. They gathered in the temple every day. They, they came to worship. They came to humble themselves before the presence of God. Okay? So we've got... We've got scripture, we've got fellowship, we've got breaking of bread and prayers, and we've got worship. Those are some foundational pieces. Today you might have noticed that uh, we've got some communion elements up here. And if you're uh, paying attention to your bulletin, you might have noticed that we're going to be doing communion. And, And some of you Methodists out there are looking at the calendar going, did I miss a week? Because typically we do communion on the first Sunday of the month in the main service, right? But... I was so moved by what the Lord was sharing with me and, and how I was uh, 
uh, coming across some really rich uh, blessings in, in the Word of God and some teaching of some, some, uh, some pastors that I've come to follow that I felt compelled, and the worship committee uh, was gracious enough to go along with my, with my crazy idea, uh, that we might actually be able to do communion in the church service on a Sunday other than the first Sunday of the month. And I just felt like we needed to be not only in prayer and fellowship and in worship and in the word, but we also needed to be gathered around the table of our Lord. We needed to be breaking the bread together as the body of Christ. And so we're going to do communion in a little bit, but I want to talk about this breaking of bread. Breaking of bread here becomes kind of a shorthand for life in the church. The life of the early church becomes as... uh, One pastor described it, the bread in Jesus' hands. The breaking of the bread becomes the life of the church, which means the bread of life in the hands of Jesus. Three times, Luke describes Jesus gathered for a meal and breaking bread. The first is the Last Supper. The Last Supper, when it's the obvious, right? Jesus gives thanks. Then the walk to Emmaus. Some of you remember this, the walk to Emmaus after Jesus is raised, before he reveals himself to many of the disciples. He's walking along with these two disciples from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and he conceals himself from them so they don't recognize him. And they're telling him all about all of this crucifixion stuff that happened and how disappointed they were. And they get to the end of their journey, and Jesus acts like he's going to go on. And they say, no, come and join us for a meal. Stay with us. It's late. And Jesus gathers around that table, and he breaks the bread. He blesses it and breaks it and gives it, and as soon as he does, they recognize who he is, and he vanishes. And then there's one we don't often think about, and that's the feeding of the 5,000. Thousands of people have gathered in the open air, and everybody needs to be fed, and Jesus says, well, you feed them. And the disciples say, well, we don't really have enough. We couldn't possibly have enough to feed everybody, and Jesus says, what do you have? Well, we've got these five loaves and these two fish. And he takes the bread and he gives thanks, a blessing. He breaks it and he gives it. This three-movement, this three-part movement happens in each of these stories, this blessing and breaking and giving of the bread. And it becomes, in the hands of Luke as the author, this shorthand for what it means to be the bread in Jesus' hands. What does it mean for us to be the bread in Jesus' hands? We will address the movement of the broken and the given next week. But today I want us to focus on the idea of being blessed in the hands of Jesus. Being blessed in the hands of Jesus. Blessed in the Christian life is not about life working out the way we want. You ever notice that? You ever notice that your life didn't immediately become perfect the moment you became a follower of Jesus? Anybody with me on that? Anybody not experience that? Because that would be really miraculous, okay? The word blessed here, okay, this being blessed in the Christian life is not about life working out the way we want it to. If anything, it's the exact opposite. Jesus promises that following him would bring persecution, This blessing and breaking and giving uh, sort of three-part movement was first brought to my attention uh, by a guy named Pacquiam, uh, the pastor in uh, Colorado Springs and a writer of of Christian worship music. Uh, He described in what's called the Seven Minute Seminary, if anybody's interested in in a fun podcast, the Seven Minute Seminary from Seedbed is fantastic, but he did this. His name is Glenn Packiam, and he did this movement of this, this blessing and breaking and giving. And Packiam lifts up the idea that to be blessed is to be returned to our original identity. To be blessed in the Christian walk is to be returned to our original identity as image bearers of God, as sons and daughters of the Almighty. And Jesus comes, as Paul says, that we might be sons and daughters of God. God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. So this idea of being blessed, although it doesn't necessarily mean everything's going to work out just the way we want it, 
really means a returning to our original identity. And it, sometimes that means getting rid of some stuff that we might, we might like to hang on to, right? I don't know if you've ever experienced that. You get alone with the Holy Spirit and suddenly God's like, you know, that thing that you enjoy so much, that, that needs to go. Or that, that thing that you think is good in your life is actually hurting you. It needs to go. But I'm going to replace it with a love and a grace beyond all imagine. That's what the last six weeks have been about. Right? But if we're returning to our original identity as a blessing, we think about ourselves as the church, the bread of life in the hands of Jesus, returning to our original identity. And isn't that exactly what Jesus does? Returns us to our original identity. If any of you have been through the, the, uh, the Epic of Eden studies that we have been uh, using in our, in our Bible study programs this year, you'll remember that there was a great fall, and then God began the rescue plan. And the rescue plan goes through all of these different covenants until we finally get to the new covenant that Jesus brings at the table. The new covenant of salvation, the forgiveness of sin, the restoration of the image of God in each and every one of us. That's exactly what Jesus does, is return us to our original identity, which is to be blessed. The question is, what does that mean for us as the church? To be returned to our original identity, to be blessed in the hands of Jesus. For that, I want us to turn to this passage in Luke 14. I don't know about you, but I, I've seen these passages, and I've even preached these passages, kind of... Um, independent of one another, right? There's the, the where do you sit at the table teaching, and then there's the who do you invite to the table teaching, and then there's the who comes and doesn't come teaching, right, in this movement. But if we actually look at the context, it's all at the same meal. So it's very appropriate for us <clears throat> to take a look at this whole movement as one teaching about Jesus, and it's, it goes far beyond manners, right? If we look at the setting, go back just a few verses before where Jenny began in verse 7. Uh, Jesus has been invited to a meal at, a, at the home of a Pharisee, uh, a leader of the Pharisees, in fact. And right away, before anything gets going, uh, he sort of pokes the bear. Right? Jesus kind of pokes the bear. If, you, if you're familiar with the story, you'll remember Jesus uh, is there. And in, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. Now, I had to look up what dropsy was. Anybody, anybody familiar with this uh, medical condition? Okay. Apparently, dropsy is a water retention problem, right? Okay. Who knew, right? So uh, there was a man with dropsy. We don't get his name. We don't even really hear anything much more about him other than Jesus is going to make an example of, of this person. Jesus asked the lawyers and the Pharisees. Remember, he's at the leader's house of these Pharisees, and he says, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not, knowing it's the Sabbath? See Jesus poking the bear a little bit, right? Kind of goating them. But they were silent. Remember, they respected Jesus enough to invite him to dinner. So they've seen him do some pretty amazing things, and they're hesitant to answer his question. So Jesus took him, they were silent, so Jesus took the man with dropsy and healed him and sent him away. That's all we hear about the guy with dropsy, right? He doesn't get a line, he doesn't get a name, he's just the man with dropsy. And Jesus looks at them and he says, if one of you, if one of you has a child or an ox that has fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull out, pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. So already Jesus is off to a, a stunning start here at this meal, right? He, he's already poked the bear. He's riled them up. He's challenged their very thought because they were convinced that healing people on the Sabbath was a sin, was against the law. And yet Jesus does it almost off the cuff. We don't even think about the fact that Jesus heals the guy because it's so lost over in the story. 
So he pokes the bear, and then they, they sit down, right? He notices how the guests choose their place of honor. He teaches them what seems like a lesson in etiquette. You ever, you ever get that wrong? Which fork goes with what part of the meal, right? You ever slurp too loud? You know, you get that soup. That's me, a little slurpy, right? You get a little, get a little etiquette problem. Well, Jesus gives us what seems like this lesson in etiquette, right? If, if you are uh, at a table, you've been invited to a party, don't sit in the place of highest honor because then the host will come around and say, someone here who is more important than you, so you get up and move down, and by then the only seat will be the lowest seat. He says, no, you go take the lowest seat, and when the host realizes you're in the lowest seat, he will come by and he will help you find the proper place for you. Move up where you belong. A couple things I want to think about this for just a moment. If God is the host of this parable, right? If God is, is the host of the parable at this dinner, at this meal, then humility, humility, which is what Jesus is really teaching, not etiquette. He's teaching about humility. Humility is about letting God put us in the right spot. Not putting ourselves in the spot we'd like. You think about that? How hard is that sometimes? How hard is that sometimes when, when we think we know where we belong at the table? We think we know what place of honor we might occupy in the, in the pecking order of people at the, at the, the meal. But real humility is... Is, is not about thinking less of yourself, right? I've heard it said that humility is about thinking of yourself less. And so you put yourself in the lowest position and you let God put you where God needs you. You let God put you in the right spot. As the church, striving to understand our, our identity, trying to recapture our true identity, in the hands of Jesus, we are to be humble enough to put ourselves in the lowest spot and let Christ plant us where we need to be planted. Where do we need to be? We need to be exactly where God put us. We need to be exactly where God put us. The second thing we need to do is we need to trust that as sons and daughters, God sustains us in that spot. You ever get a little too ambitious? You get in over your head? With something, right? You ever experience that? I, I do that sometimes when it's when it's time to do a project at the house, right? Time to do a project at the house, and I get in over my head, and about that time, you're like, I'm not sure I can get myself out of this problem. Anybody experienced that before? You get yourself a little in over your head in a home improvement, something or another, right? Okay? Well, I'm not alone there. There are those times where you're like, I need YouTube and to pray right now, okay? Because I need to figure out how to do whatever it is I'm, I'm doing. But when we try to put ourselves in a place that, that God doesn't need us, that God doesn't want us, when we try to elevate ourselves beyond where God has us, then we have to sustain that on our own. We have to sustain that on our own. If we run out ahead of where God wants us to be, then it's by our own power that we'll be able to stay there. And our power will eventually run out. But wherever God places us, wherever God plants us, God sustains us. There's a reason that we are here. There's a reason for us to be the church, the body of Christ, here in Brighton. And it can be tempting to look at that church down the street, or that community up the road, or that denomination across the way, and wonder why we're not them, why we can't make that happen, why we can't get this going, when we need to recognize that we are where God needs us to be. And as long as we're where God needs us to be, God will sustain our being there. We cannot even affect the outcome of the global United Methodist Church and all that it's doing right now, let alone the world. But if we focus on what we cannot do, or we try to do what we cannot do, then we miss our opportunity to bring the kingdom of God right here. 
We miss the opportunity right here. We can become so discouraged when we say, well, we don't know what our denomination is going to do. We don't know if this world is going to, right, hell in a handbasket, right? Where did that phrase come from? Anybody want to know? Somebody knows. I'd love to know after the service, right? But you just watch the news, and you're like, oh, the country's falling apart, and there's this problem in another part of the country, and there's another problem across the world, and there's a war over there, and there's a famine over here, and there's drought everywhere, and we get so discouraged that we can't change everything. We can get so discouraged that we can't affect the change in the church that we might want to see, that we might even think God wants to see. But if we focus on that, if we focus on what we cannot do and we focus on doing what we cannot do, then we miss our opportunity to be the kingdom of God right here and right now in the ways God is calling us to be the church, in the way God is wanting us to be who we really are who God calls us to be, who God created us to be. Then this fascinating thing happens. Jesus teaches then about, to the host, who who you should invite. Don't invite people who can invite you back, because then you're just sort of paying each other back. But look at the list. When you throw a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, because they cannot repay you. And upon hearing this, one of the dinner guests, he he comes up and he says, blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Isn't that an interesting phrase? Given all the places where we've talked about Jesus and bread throughout the Gospel of Luke. This is what he says, blessed is the one who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now, do you think Jesus might just say, well, yeah, of course, that seems like a pretty obvious statement, right? If you're eating bread in the kingdom of God. But then he, he tells another parable. He tells this other parable, right? This parable of people who were invited to the banquet who gave excuses why they couldn't come, right? Who gave excuses why they couldn't come. I just love these excuses. I'm throwing a party. Come and eat with me. And, well, I just bought some land. i got to go check it out. And I just bought some ox. I'm going to go test them out, right? We might translate this into, I just bought a new house and i got to move in. Right? I just bought a new car, I'm going to take it for a spin. Sorry, please accept my regrets. I've just been married, I can't be bothered. Please accept my regrets. Right? You get these guests who don't show up for various reasons. These invited guests who don't come. Think about humility as allowing God to place you. Right? If humility is about where God, allowing God to place you, then, then refusing the invitation is a problem. Right? If you don't even show up, then God can't place you where you need to be. But then the master instructs them to go out and to gather the, what? the poor and the crippled, the blind, and the lame. That's an interesting, uh, I think I've heard that somewhere else before. Right? I think that's who Jesus told them to invite the crippled and the lame and the blind and the poor. Those few verses between these two parables are not throwaway verses. Jesus is saying, you're supposed to invite these folks. And then he says, we invited everybody, and the ones we invited didn't come, so we went out and we got the folks that I told you to invite to begin with. The poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Essentially, he says, go get the people who seem the most broken who need to be returned to their original identity as whole. Whenever Jesus sends out his disciples, do you remember what he tells them? He says, go and announce the kingdom of God and heal people. And he empowers them to heal people. Right? In, in one case, in Matthew, he even says, raise the dead. Right? Cast out demons, raise the dead, cure the sick, heal the lame. Whenever Jesus sends people, he says, go to the people who are broken and make them whole in my name. Go and find the people who need wholeness the most, who are the most broken around. Bring them here so that they might find their original identity in Christ. We, the church, when we humble ourselves so as to allow God to place us, then we must embody God's invitation to the table where people are returned to their original identity. It can't be just about the people who are here. 
and what pecking order God would place us in. It's about who's not here who needs to be. You see, we're the slave in the parable being told to go gather the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. I don't know if any of you pay attention to the bulletin, but every week I select a silent preparation quote. And sometimes those quotes come very easily. Sometimes they, they take me a while to, to settle, settle on one. But this one from, uh, from a gal named Pauline Phillips is one I've heard in many settings. I was curious to find, find out that, that Phillips was the originator of this uh, saying. But um, she said that a church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. The church is a hospital for sinners and not a museum for saints. Now, if we were a museum for saints, it would be all about which person was at the most important spot in the table, right? We'd assign pews and uh, we'd charge you a certain amount based on where you sat. The back row would be the most expensive because that's where you all love to live, right? I'm just kidding. I love you back rowers. But the church is not a museum for the saints. A church is a hospital for the sinners. And guess who we are? Guess who we are? We're the parking lot attendants. And we're the orderlies. And the janitors. And the people who come around and take your blood pressure at all hours of the night. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? We're the phlebotomists who come by and poke you. Right? To make sure that everything's working. We're the people who facilitate the great physician in the healing of the broken. In the hospital for sinners. You see what I'm saying? You know what's fascinating about this is I had no idea who Pauline Phillips was until I looked her up online. Because I never quote somebody I don't know about. So I looked her up online. It turns out that Pauline Phillips was the first Dear Abby. The advice columnist. Right? He was the first Dear Abby. Isn't that fascinating? The church is a hospital for sinners, not a museum for saints. It's important for us to remember that while we might be orderlies and parking lot attendants and janitors and maybe even nurses in the hospital for the sinners, that, that we need the hospital just as much as we need to be part of the hospital, right? That we are a collection of people who are broken, who find our true identity in Christ together. You are led by people who head up ministry areas who are broken, who need to find their true identity in Christ. You are led by a pastor who is broken and who needs to find his true identity in Christ in the hands of Jesus. We gather as a church blessed in the hands of our Savior Jesus Christ to be healed, to be returned to our original identity, and then to become conduits, to become on-ramps, to be the slave from the story sent out into the streets to invite the broken around us to know the healing power of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. We have been planted here, and we cannot become preoccupied with things we cannot do, with the events we cannot control, Just as in life, the only thing we can control is how we respond. And we will respond as a hospital for sinners, going out into the world to find the poor and the broken and to introduce them to the great physician, Jesus Christ, who brings wholeness to our identity. We do both. We do both as we prepare to come to the table. The table where Jesus takes us in his hands and breaks us after blessing us and gives us. Are you ready for your homework? There's always a little groan whenever I say homework. Some of you have some PTSD or something about homework. Not sure. Homework. We're continuing our Thirsty 30, of course. We want to encourage you, if you, if you don't do this already, uh, to, to pick this up. This is a, 
This is a real simple formula for you. Thirsty 30, 10 minutes of Bible reading. Don't care what you read in the Bible, just open it up and read. God will find you there, okay? 10 minutes of Bible reading, 10 minutes of prayer, and 10 minutes of worship. Put on some worship music, listen to a hymn, calm yourself to sleep, whatever you do, okay, for worship. Enter the, the presence of God. But I, here's what I really want you to do. In addition to your 30, your thirsty 30, I want you to pray for the church. Because the church needs your prayers. The church needs your prayers. Not, not just the denomination. We, as a congregation, Brighton United Methodist Church, we need your prayers in this time. And so I want to encourage you to pray for the church. If you have no idea how to do that, come back at 1 o'clock, and I hope I can provide some help in guiding us through that. But be in prayer for the church. This is, a, this is an important week. There are people making important decisions on our behalf, and so we want to keep them in prayer. We want to invite the Holy Spirit to be present with them, guiding them in all that they do. Can we pray? I feel like we need to pray. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, humble us at your throne. Bring us into your banquet that we might be the bread of life in the hands of our Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, restore us to our original identity through the powerful love and grace brought to us by the cross of our Savior. Lord, fill us with the courage to bring in the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, that all would come to know wholeness in your presence. Lord, you have planted us here. Help us build your kingdom here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Normally we would transition into our offering. But we're going to do an extended version of our uh, communion liturgy today. And so I want to encourage you to turn to page uh, 12 in your hymnal. Grab a hold of the big hymnal and find your way to page 12. In an effort to humble ourselves before the Lord and to prayer, prepare our hearts to be planted wherever God needs us. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, we come before him, confessing our sin before God and before one another. May we join in the confession and pardon. Merciful God, <clears throat> we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As we enter into a time of silent prayer, I encourage you to lift up any ways that you know that God is bringing up before you that you are falling short of his glory. Lift those confessions to the Lord now. <clears throat> Hear me, church, as I declare to you, Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. As we have brought our confessions before the Lord, now we greet each other in the peace of Christ. May we pass the peace of Christ to one another now.
us and be a part of his family through our actions and gifts. Will the ushers please come forward? to prayer. Dear God, thank you for all you have done. Please bless all these people in our church, old or young, small or tall. Be with them and help them out. Bless this money before me so it can do good things in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. In your uh, hymnals on page 13 for the great thanksgiving. While you're turning, I'll just uh, remind us all that everyone is welcome at the table of our Lord in the United Methodist Church. Regardless of age, race, gender, or creed, if you seek to love God, come. 
that you might be in the presence of God with the people of God here in this place. You are invited. And now join me in the liturgy. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and of earth. Before the mountains were brought forth, or you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness, and you brought forth light on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and you spoke to us through your prophets. And so with all your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night when he gave himself up for us, he gathered with his disciples at a meal. And around that meal, he took the bread, and he blessed it, giving thanks to you, O God. And he broke the bread. And he said, take and eat of this, all of you, for this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat of this, remember, I am with you. And when the meal was over, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks to you, O God. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of this, remember, I am with you. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on all who will receive you in this holy sacrament. Bring that spirit upon these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we who feast at this table may be nourished in our faith, that we may recognize your presence, be overwhelmed by your generous abundance, and renewed in our commitment to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. Humble us to grow where you have planted us, that we as sons and daughters might be living invitations to receive your amazing grace. Help us to be your church today and always. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, here in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. This morning we're going to be doing a communion a little differently than you're used to. We're going to be doing something called intinction today. Uh, if you've been to some of our smaller services, you might be familiar with this. You'll come forward, and you take a piece of the bread from the loaf that we've just blessed in prayer. And you dip it in the cup of juice. And you're welcome to return to your uh, seat at that point in prayer. You're welcome to kneel at one of the communion rails that are up this morning. Come to God in prayer. Come to the table of our Lord Jesus. You, you are invited.
now as we prepare to make the transition from the worship of this place to the worship of our everyday lives, I want to encourage you, if you have need of further prayer following our service today, to make your way to the front and be uh, prayed for by one of our uh, Stephen ministers, or remain where you're at, and they will come and find you after the service and pray with you there. May we rise as we are able, and now join in our benediction song. Oh, now in peace, never be afraid. God will go with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong, and true. No, he will guide you. Now may you go from this place to grow where God has planted you. Go be who God created you to be. Go in love. Go in peace. Amen.